My name is Baraz Mohammadi. I am the chair of the LGBT committee for the criminal justice section. We have an incredible, impressive panel with us today to talk about a very important and timely issue. Uh, and if you want evidence of how timely this topic is, uh, you know, look no further than the fact that just yesterday, another state, North Dakota, uh, signed a bill criminalizing the provision of gender-affirming care for transgender youth. Earlier this month, Idaho passed a similar bill, and last month, here in the state of Tennessee, a, uh, a ban on provision of gender-affirming care was also passed. You know, we, we circulated a report from the Williams Institute that was dated March 2023 uh, about the status of these laws, and it's already outdated. Uh, that's how quickly and rapidly this movement to ban this type of care is progressing in the country. Uh, but, you know, we're going to get into all that, what it means uh, to provide gender-affirming care, what it means to be transgender, um, and we have an incredible panel to, to help us with that. So I'm going to start with introductions. To my left, I have Professor Regina Hillman. Uh, and is it okay if I refer to everyone by their first names? Thank you. Uh, Regina is an assistant professor of law at the University of Memphis, Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. Prior to joining the faculty at Memphis Law in 2017, Regina taught legal process one and two as an adjunct professor at the University of Tennessee College of Law from 2010 to 2017, an undergraduate and graduate level classes on business law and ethics and employment and labor law at Tusculum College from 2003 to 2017. In 2013, Regina was an organizing member of the Tennessee Marriage Equality Legal Team that challenged Tennessee's constitutional and statutory bans on recognition of valid out-of-state same-sex marriages. Regina serves as the co-chair of the University of Memphis Pride and Equality Alliance, which consists of LGBTQ plus faculty and staff and allies university-wide and also as the law school faculty advisor to the LGBTQ plus law student group, Outlaw. Regina teaches courses in LGBTQ plus rights and gender in the law. So great to have you here, Regina. To Regina's left, we have Jen Jennifer Pepper. Jennifer is the president and CEO of Choices Center for Reproductive Health. She has worked in the field of sexual and reproductive health since graduating from Rhodes College. Jennifer started at Choices in 2003 as a patient educator and advocate. At that time, Jennifer also worked at Le Bon Hur Children's Hospital, sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, and the American Red Cross as an HIV educator. In 2006, she was promoted to Choices Community Outreach Coordinator and eventually to Deputy Director. In 2013, Jennifer left Choices to lead the Memphis Ryan White Program with the Shelby County government. After earning her MBA, Jennifer returned to Choices in 2018 as a Director of Finance and Operations and was promoted to President and CEO in January 2021. To her left, we have Molly Rose Quinn. Molly is the Executive Director of Out Memphis, a nonprofit organization that empowers, connects, and educates and advocates for the LGBT community of the Mid-South. Molly is a writer and nonprofit administrator. Before coming to Out Memphis, she led literary and other cultural programming at a variety of New York City nonprofit organizations, including as the Director of Public Programming at Housing Works Bookstore Cafe, a cultural venue that supports Housing Works Incorporated, NYC's largest service provider to New Yorkers experiences, experiencing the dual crisis of homelessness and HIV AIDS. In 2017, she returned to her hometown of Memphis to co-found the Center for Southern Literary Arts and, is in, and its inaugural Memphis Literary Arts Festival which occurred in 2018. As a writer, her essays, poetry, and profiles have appeared in a range of print and digital publications. She's a 2018 Young Cultural Innovators Fellow with the Salzburg Global Seminar. She currently serves as administrator for LitNet, a literary network, the nation's only advocacy coalition for public funding for literature. And finally, uh, Lucas Cameron Ball. Lucas is a staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union of Tennessee, where he was part of the legal team challenging Tennessee's ban of gender-affirming health care. Lucas has represented children and adults who are trans in civil rights, employment, criminal, and immigration proceedings. Lucas, says, Lucas has said that trans youth in Tennessee deserves the support and care necessary to give them the same chance to thrive as their peers. Gender-affirming care is a critical part of helping transgender adolescents succeed in school establish healthy relationships with their friends and family, live authentically as themselves, and dream about their futures. Thank you all so much for being here. 
So we have some topics to, to cover, but before we get into the, the laws, the statutes, the constitutionality of, of the bans, I think it's important to kind of note that we use this phrase LGBT, and it kind of implies that all the struggles and challenges that that group faces is homogenous. And, and that's not the case. There are there are unique challenges that the transgender community suffers, and I think it's important to, to draw attention to that and to put a face to that community. So so Molly, I want to start with you. Um, what what are the challenges that trans youth face, both here in Tennessee and, and nationally? Okay, so it's working? Yes. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for this question. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of months to speak to a lot of different people and audiences about trans youth and their families in our region um, and done a lot of thinking about how we share those stories. Some of that work I've done in partnership with the people on either side of me. Um, but I think what's important to understand about trans young people now is uh, how deeply they understand what is happening to them. Um, we, uh, the Outmethis hosts this amazing youth group. It's called PRISM. It's for 11 to 17 year olds. And it's called a youth group, but it's a, a wide ranging program. Um, and there are 90 young people in it, um, and they meet every week and engage in a bunch of different programs and services, and their parents and caregivers meet together um, at the same time that their meeting is happening, which they've been doing for the last month. Um, and their, their lives right now are, are like a, a battlefield. Every aspect of their daily life, from their experiences in the education system to their experiences, with their pediatrician, their relationship with their parents, and their relationship to their peers, to the community, um, is completely and utterly saturated by our political climate. Um, I think there are actually probably more trans and LGBTQ adults who, who are less connected to the day-to-day goings-on of our political climate and new laws and new events than the young people. For them, it's, it's everything to them. Um, I think as well as a, a great place to start talking about the, you know, the different kinds of intersectional factors in our community. I, I think as well, you know, young people really feel that this, you know, this fight for trans humanity is something that belongs to their whole generation. Um, they take it so seriously, even those who are not trans or gender non-conforming, those who are allies. Um, I have a, a, a 17 year old stepsister-in-law who I get most of my like understanding of the world from. <laughs> and she and her peers, they really, really feel like the, the fight for trans healthcare is something that belongs to all of them. Um, they're so informed about healthcare, they're so informed about their rights. Um, they are advocates, they understand their rights in the schools, um, but they are truly struggling to find healthy and joyful and normal average days. Um, Lucas and I actually uh, met with some of the parents uh, of our youth group a couple of months ago, and they, they raised something that I, I brought to a, a lot of meetings and a voice to a lot of people, which is that uh, trans teens and gender non-conforming teens right now are also the young people who just lived through a pandemic that was so disruptive to the experience of education. So we're talking about youth that perhaps had negative experiences at school, then were interrupted in the, the journey through remote learning, which was you know a socially, emotionally, academically disruptive time for so many youth. There are a lot of young people, if you're 17 now, maybe you came out during the pandemic and then had a completely different relationship to your peer group than any generation before you. Um, so I, that's, you know, uh, some 
random thoughts maybe about the things that we hear and the things that we are experiencing. But I do, you know, really want to want to lift up how deeply they understand what's happening to them. Um, they're not deterred by protesters or by comments or social media commentary. They understand those things so deeply, which I, I really think is is so unfair to them, but very beautiful to see. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. And I, to, to take a step back, I think kind of it's it's well known, but to be transgender, I think that the definition is that your gender identity does not align with your sex assigned at birth. But that's just kind of a textbook definition of it. There's, there's so much more to, to that community. And that kind of feeds into the importance of gender affirming care, but not a lot of people know what that is. Uh, so Jennifer, could you kind of just describe what is gender affirming care? What forms does it come in? I think it's a really interesting We work together all the time. Yeah. We can handle this. I would say, I think this is a really interesting question. What is gender affirming care? I think it also throws in the light of, of like, what is gender, right? And uh, I think all too often, especially the folks that are putting these laws together, really think of gender affirming care solely as surgery, specifically surgery that relates to people's genitals, um, which just stop being obsessed with people's genitals. It's weird. Stop doing it. Um, but gender affirming care as a whole is around helping people live authentically and to have, live healthfully and in high well-being based on the gender and the gender roles and identity that they feel are most authentic to them. And so that includes medical care, which is the part that Choices provides. That can look like a lot of things. Uh, most commonly, I think, for folks, it looks often like gen or hormone, home, hormone replacement therapy. It's Friday afternoon, no. uh, Puberty blockers are a, are a medical intervention deployed sometimes, and sometimes surgery is part of it too, but often not for minors. Uh, also, mental health and social support services are critical pieces around gender affirming care for folks. Um, I think it's also interesting to think about what are, for those of us that are cisgender, so meaning we identify with the gender we were assigned at birth, what gender affirming care practices do we participate in? And so I think Viagra is gender affirming care. I, think, I did take your line, I said it first. Uh, I think just kind of anything that helps us increase and perform the gender that we identify with could be considered gender affirming care. And so this thing absolutely impacts all of us in a much larger way. Thank you, Jennifer. And, and Regina, I, I kind of want to turn to you. So could you walk us through what, what is this wave? You know, what, what do these laws say that have kind of been sweeping the country and how do they limit the care that can be provided to this community? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, most of the laws are either banning or limiting the, avail the availability of gender affirming care, which is often life saving care. Um, it's also medically recommended by almost all major medical associations. So it's putting up roadblocks, sometimes complete roadblocks, to the availability of these um, type of care. It represents, in my opinion, one of the most real extreme and coordinated attacks on the LGBT community and specifically on the transgender community. Um, we're seeing really, literally, I think all but six states this year, by, by now, at this current moment, which changes as we, as we sit here, um, have had either a law that they have brought before, that they brought in the legislature, they've looked at a measure we, through an executive order power, or um, are cons currently considering uh, introducing these laws. And so I wanted to just point out, they vary in, in quite considerably, but I wanted to point out, and I had to bring a, a paper, because it's so many different ways that these laws vary. So we have everything from where gender affirming care is being relabeled as child abuse, child neglect, um, several of the laws or bills carry severe penalties. 
So there's a range from misdemeanors to felony criminal punishments. And those are both for medical professionals and for parents or guardians, legal guardians of the, of the um, transgender student, or student, transgender child. Um, professional disciplinary action for medical professionals. The things that, are, some of them are just staggering to me, where you can file for damages of, against a medical professional up to 20 to 30 years after the procedure takes place. Um, so they're, the, they're limiting insurance coverage for state insurance, state care, and um, some require nurses, counselors, teachers, principals, administrative schools, um, school officials to not have any action whatsoever in affirming a child's gender identity. So it, it's a very wide range of approaches, some less, but they're all terrible laws uh, for bills or propositions to, to the law, but some of them are just uh, unbelievable in the staggering in the um, nature of the remedies available. Thank you, Jeanette. So, so Lucas, let's let's focus on one law in particular. I'm just going to randomly say Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> what what is specific in that bill, uh, and, and why? How does it compare, or is it more or less strict than, than other bills in, in the country? Um, so, well. I just want to say thank you for having me here. I'm really glad to be here and be talking on this uh, subject with you all. Um, all of these bills are pretty much similar to Tennessee's um, in that they do not actually have real substantive reasons why they're being passed, and they don't actually do anything that uh, would be uh, something that would be in the interest of the state to get into. Um, they're mostly when courts have looked at these cases, every court that's examined it and actually looked at it on the merits, listened to the expert testimony, has found that these laws do not hold up. Um, and at the end of the day, they're uh, passed because it's um, politically convenient. Um, it's an easy target to pick on, I think, with young children who don't have voting rights, um, and a uh, community that's already afraid to come out and be public about it. Um, and in general, these laws are pretty much the same throughout the country and what they do. There are some with criminal sanctions, but the majority of them are civil in nature, and um, every, every court that's looked at them has blocked them up to this point, which would be Alabama and Arkansas. And Arkansas, the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest, and in Alabama, the Department of Justice actually intervened um, because of the seriousness of the rights that are um, uh, being threatened with these laws. Thank you, Lucas. Um, so, I kind of, I think we all have a similar view of, of whether or not these laws are beneficial, but I don't want to create kind of an echo chamber. So in Alabama, uh, I believe, sorry, Arkansas, the, the, the statute made its way to the Eighth Circuit, and there's been kind of a lot of briefing on it, so I actually went into the, the defendants in that case. And what are the points they're trying to make as to why these laws should be passed? And I kind of thought we should, we should discuss it and address what their arguments are. So, Jennifer, starting with you, one of the, the main arguments is the lack of efficacy of the banned care. That these, these types of care that are provided are just not helpful as much as the community says that they, it is. What, what's the response to that? I think in our American court systems right now, we have a real problem with junk science being entered as evidence and testimony. Um, and also as a, an abortion provider that is very real in our world currently as we wait for yet another Supreme Court decision on abortion access today. Um, it has been proven over and over that gender affirming care is not only efficacious, but life-saving for transgender and non-binary youth. It has been shown 
and the reduced rates of suicidal thought and ideation uh, to help improve overall health and well-being. And so I think it is, I know it is important that we critically examine the evidence that is being presented to us and not in a, a way to be elitist, but to really rely on the strongest science in order to make decisions. And the strong, supported, peer-reviewed science is very clear that gender-affirming care is life-saving for adolescents and adults. So, so Molly, another, another argument that you hear is that a lot of trans youth end up regretting the decision to go to gender-affirming care, um, whether it's hormone placement, as Jennifer said, in very small amount of cases, you know, surgeries. In your experience at Outlandis, is that is there truth to that? Um, you know, there are actually a, a lot of really valuable resources um, on, online from other healthcare providers and other legal organizations that debunk that that regret thing that you're talking about. Um, which is not my, my area of expertise, so I won't speak necessarily on like those kind of numbers or where those different pieces come from. Um, but what I, what I can speak to, I, I think, is that um, our, the, the idea that whether or not there, there is a, a young person who had a bad experience with gender affirming care um, is also still not the business of lawmakers with, with no actual experience. Um, is still a decision that should be made between caregivers, young people, and their healthcare providers, um, regardless of the degree of what kind of healthcare they're getting, whether it's a band-aid or a surgery. Um, those are not decisions that should be made on the state level in the way that they are being made. Um, so I, I think it's, um, well, well, I'm happy to sit here and say, you know, no, there really are a lot of people who, who gender affirming care in any way. I think that's not even really the narrative that's important. I, I think that this isn't, this shouldn't be a legal issue. Um, I think what we're really talking about is the politicization, polarization of public health that has plagued this country for the last three years um, from the COVID-19 pandemic to the Dobbs decision to gender affirming care. I think none of it has to do with actual health care. And that the, the reason that this panel is even happening it shouldn't, shouldn't be a part of this discussion. Um, the relationship between a parent and a pediatrician or between a healthcare provider is one of the most sacred relationships. Anyone who's a parent or an aunt or a neighbor knows that having a young person in your care, your relationship to healthcare providers, and the idea that we have lawmakers interrupting that sacred relationship is the reason that there is confusion around this whatsoever. No, and that's a good segue to kind of one of the other reasons that is actually put forward by the defense is that band this type of treatment has risks and side effects, which tell me what kind of treatment does it, right? So uh, it's interesting, which, which brings me back to Regina. What, what do you think is driving this legislation uh, and so rapidly across the country? I think that there's been a lot of changes, positive changes for the LGBT community. So we've seen marriage equality take place in 2015. In 2020, we had both stock, we had employment protections. And I, I think that unfortunately, transgender youth are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They have an easy target. And so it's kind of that other is shifting a bit because protections have been provided. We're still, shape, we're still you know, shaking it out and just determining how far, as far as title, Seven, and of course, Title IX will be finding out in the next month or so um, how that's going to shake out. But transgender youth are a vulnerable uh, segment of the community. It's an easy target in that children, protecting children, the idea of protecting children, and that's what you hear over and over again. Um, although it doesn't really align with the fact that you have all of these major medical, I, I brought this list because I was stunned when I saw it. These are the lists of major medical associations. I just highlighted a few, but all of it, American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Pediatric Association, the American Endocrinology, um, Endocrinology Association, all pediatrics, all psychological, psychiatry related. And the idea to me that 
uh, members of a legislature who are not medical professionals are making a decision for a person's mental and physical well-being and, and taking that right from the parents um, in coordination in conjunction with their child and with the um, health care provider. And I think that it's also a situation where we've seen a lot of kind of fear mongering about, you mentioned this earlier, that when you hear about affirmative care, um, folks think that, you know, little Timmy comes home from school and says, I think I might be a transgender. And the mom picks up the phone and calls the doctor to schedule surgery. And it's so completely, completely not that. But I think it's a lack of understanding, a lack of education, a, a no desire to be educated. The more I learn and educate myself about it, the more um, I, my feelings are just stronger and stronger about the importance of gender affirming care. So uh, unfortunately, I think that we have in certain segments of gain rights, other segments of society, um, this, it shifts over. And this has been a real coordinated, shifted um, attack on transgender youth. And, and we'll get a little later about logistically how does it how does it work when a trans youth wants to go about seeking gender affirming care, what that process is. But uh, to, to kind of flip to the, to the legal side of the Lucas, I guess the question is, are these bans constitutional? Is it a close call? I don't think it's a close call at all. I mean, they definitely violate, and what we argue is they violate the equal protection of these children because of their sex and because of their transgender status. Also, their parents for having transgender children because of their sex or their um, transgender status. Um, also, we're looking at fundamental rights that are being uh, affected and threatened, um, such as the right to the care and custody of your children, which has been a long established right. Um, and also now we have federal laws, uh, like Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which prohibits sex discrimination in healthcare. And so what a lot of these state legislators are mandating that physicians do is directly in, in contrast and preempted by the federal law. And, and how are the, you know, you mentioned a couple of these bans in, in Alabama, Arkansas, have already made their way through the courts. What have the courts, have, what have the courts been saying? I mean, the courts look at the actual uh, lives of these families and these children and what they've actually gone through and where they've gotten to where they are. And I think people have really a lot of misconceptions about gender affirming care and what that is. And so it, their kind of gut reaction is just kind of reject it because they don't understand it. Um, because a lot of people haven't had to learn about it. But what I've learned from talking to just you know, over 60 families in Tennessee, is that none of these decisions are made lightly. They're all take years and years and years to even get to the point of even going to a doctor to talk about um, medication, uh, where there are not genital surgeries happening, period, for people under 18, um, and that it's, it's a long process where there are teams of experts. It's not just their primary care physician that they talk to. They talk to experts about this. They talk to mental health care providers. They see them over a long term. Uh, and it's not, it's not a decision that they come to lightly. Obviously, no family would want to have to go through this and put their child. So, so let's talk about that decision-making process. And Jennifer, I'll, I'll come back to you. A young person comes to Choices and says, I'm trans, you know, I, they're not gonna probably say I suffer from gender dysphoria, but that's essentially what's happening. What's the process for them getting treated? Yeah, yeah the, it is a lot of the things that Lucas just described. It is a lot of conversation initially between their support person, whether that's a parent or a legal guardian. It is a lot of conversations with the healthcare provider, a doctor, an advanced practice nurse, and with uh, mental health providers and support. So we've been providing gender affirming care choices for over 10 years. Uh, we serve about 300 transgender and non-binary folk a year, 
about a 200 mile radius. There's like a lot of stigmatized healthcare. Uh, there is not nearly enough access points for this type of care. So people are traveling great distances um, and are gonna be traveling even greater distances. But it's like any other healthcare decision. It is made in concert with the medical provider, the team, and all the other support people and the parents involved. And so uh, in choices, we provide services for folks that are 16 and 17 and up. And uh, the Tennessee law hopefully will not go into effect, but if it does, there is a carve out that will allow uh, folks to continue to receive care in Tennessee if they've established care on or before July 1st. And so uh, many of the healthcare providers throughout Tennessee have went ahead and gone ahead and stopped providing gender affirming care to adolescents. But like we, Joyce's did last year, once the six week ban went into effect around abortion, we continued to provide, uh, and we're the only provider in Memphis providing abortions under the six week ban. We have also decided to continue to provide gender affirming care within the legal limits of the law to our 16 and 17 year olds through March of 2024. We have also launched gender affirming care in our second clinic in Southern Illinois, Carbondale, which you may be familiar with which we opened last year in response to the Dobbs decision so that we can continue providing abortion care. And so the truth of the matter is, just like with abortion care, where we are seeing lots of people who are not able to access that needed care because travel and finances are such an incredible barrier, we are gonna see those same barriers in place for gender affirming care when people have to start leaving their communities to access basic health care. And so that process just got a lot more complicated and more out of reach for many, many adolescents and their families. And that is incredibly unfortunate. And, and Jennifer, you mentioned that if people are still receiving care, they can continue, I think, under the statute uh, until 2024, but one, March of 2024, but one provision of the statute that, that stood out to me is that, yes, but the, the, in order for them to qualify for that, the physician must certify, and I'm reading from the statute, in writing that it's his good faith, his or her good faith medical judgment based upon the facts known to the physician at the time that ending the medical procedure would be harmful to the minor. I'm trying not to be cynical, but isn't that a, a tacit admission that these physicians, their medical evaluation and judgment has value? Molly, Molly? That's a loaded question, but I'm, I'm sending it to you. That's a question for me. Yeah. <laughs> I like that that's a question for me. I'm the, the one non-legal, non-healthcare person. <laughs> The, the movement of all these bills doesn't really have much to do with healthcare and it doesn't really have much to do with the law, like underneath it. Is that maybe part of what you're getting at? I think that's certainly true. And, and I, I think that um, it, this is going back to something that everyone has touched on, um, but the, this sort of like entire discussion around the, it, is it effective, is it dangerous, are there side effects, are there all of that? Actually, the Mayo Clinic put out this statement kind of recently that I thought was so beautiful and so missing from healthcare discourse. That was, a, 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 I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that a, a sense of not belonging has so many more negative health outcomes associated with it than any of the side effects from many different kinds of medical care. Um, that you know the depression and anxiety and isolation is associated with psychological and mental health and physical health outcomes for young people. That the, the reading about that there's something wrong with you in the paper every day is a riskier healthcare environment than HRT at the age of 13. And I think that's so important and so missing from what we're talking about. Um, and, and you know, I'll also say, Lucas was talking about, or I, I guess both of these folks, you asked a question, you know, what is it like when someone walks through the door and says, I think I'm trans or I'm looking for this kind of intervention. I, I think it's true, this is like a statistic that everyone should fact check on me, but I think it's true that like the average amount of time between when someone experiences gender dysphoric symptoms and initiates some kind of medical intervention, the average time in America is 10 years. So like we're talking about 
as many people have said, that there's this myth that folks are being rushed into care, whereas I think most people who are trans wish there was any sense of urgency over getting them into care. I think that it's like, it's truly the opposite, right? I, I think that it takes so much, especially in the South, right? Even like the folks who are who are looking for a place like Choices, they're often in communities that, that they might, they could be 20 miles from our locations and have no idea that businesses like ours exist. We have so many problems, even just communicating to people in the South and in underserved areas that the kind of social support and healthcare support exists for them, even, even outside of, of gender affirming care of any kind, that's the real barrier to health outcomes. And, and there's nothing being done to address those whatsoever. Uh, Regina, kind of, we've seen that, that legislators are kind of grasping at straws, right, to, to advocate for these, these bans. What, what kind of justifications, you know, do politicians give in support of it? And do you see any contradictions with kind of other uh, rights that conservative politicians um, kind of advocating for in other areas? It primarily is going to go back to the best interests of the child, right? They're, they're, they're helping the child, they're saving the child from uh, what could be an, un, an irreversible uh, care. Um, I'll wait to talk about Tennessee specifically, but the, the, the general justification that the states have, a child um, under 18 is not old enough to know if, they're, um, if they want to go forward with any treatment, um, whether or not the physicians, in Tennessee, um, it's kind of, I, I would imagine for physicians, pretty insulting, but it, it questions whether they're interested in performing these, um, tre performing treatment on transgender youth for financial gain. So there's multiple areas where the parents are not able to provide care for their children in the proper standard, that they can't make the right decisions so that the legislature has to step in. In Tennessee this, this year, when we had this particular um, bill introduced, along with it was another bill that had to do with education. And that bill focused so much on parental rights. Um, it was talking about what books you could read in school. We've seen a lot of book bans. It was talking about if there was sex education in school, that the parents should be told ahead of time and be able to make all decisions related to any educational um, opportunities at school that had to do with sex, that had to do with LGBT specifically, anything to do with gender identity, sexual orientation, and real, a real focus on parental rights um, we have a constitutional right for parents to raise their children as they see fit, and, and it directly contradicts what's happening with these bans for gender-affirming care. Um, one of the things that just really was, to me, gut-wrenching was to watch during the hearings in front of the Tennessee legislature. There were parents there begging um, for them to not pass this legislation. The parents weren't Republicans or Democrats. They were the parents that had a child who was transgender. And I thought about that a lot because when you're in that situation, what you're trying to do is to provide the best care possible. The parents are desperately trying to figure out and educate themselves about the situation that they find themselves in and to provide the best possible care for their child. A lot of the times I've talked to parents, I've, talked, I've spoken with them where I want my child to live to be 18 years old, as opposed to they're not old enough to make this decision. And I think one of the things that's so challenging to, to understand is that while the consequences of not having access to, to gender affirming care for these children, aside from anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, um, attempts at suicide, successful suicides, and, and the fact is that Gender affirming care works. You can hear testimonies, of, you can hear physicians speak about parents of children who wants their child who has been depressed and had been hospitalized and been suicidal and they get put on gender affirming, um, gender affirming care. Sometimes it's just presenting as the gender you identify as. 
Sometimes it's as simple as choosing a name that you feel fits your fits who you are and dressing in the in the gender that you see yourself as. And it can make worlds of difference to these children. And something that that is so effective is being determined by non-medical. So I, I think that it's uh, that there's a lot of mis misrepresentation and, and I think it just catches fire with them and that's what that's what's believed. So so Lucas kind of you're on the front lines with the ACLU of, of challenging these bans. The, the Eighth Circuit, the essentially the, the appellate court decision that enjoined the Arkansas law from going into effect, it, it, there was kind of no wishy washiness. They were pretty pretty straightforward about saying that's unconstitutional and, and granting the preliminary injunction. Is that helping the ACLU in their fight against the Tennessee statute? What's the arguments that the ACLU is making to, to stop the Tennessee law and join it? Well, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, so it's not directly relevant, right? Like, the Eighth Circuit could do something completely different than the Sixth Circuit might do. Um, and so, you know, we really don't know, you know, what the Sixth Circuit is going to do or what our district court is going to do. Um, but even, you know, uh, circuits that have been traditionally seen as more conservative circuits, when they look at the evidence, they look at the science, say, yes, absolutely, it does damage to these children for these laws to go into effect. Um, and, you know, the same in our case, you know, as we are, you know, arguing that we believe that we're going to win on the merits of this case, ultimately, and that the, the harm to the children is far outweighed by the harm to the state of Tennessee by allowing the status quo to continue. Um, and that it's, you know, clearly in the public interest to protect its constitutional rights. Yeah, I mean, I just, for the, for the audience, I mean, I'm by no means a constitutional <laughs> law expert, but the standard, the heightened standard that they need to show is that the statute is substantially related to a sufficiently important government interest and for anyone who's taking common law, that can mean a whole bunch of different things, a whole bunch of different judges. Um, but at least in the Eighth Circuit, they said that the state did not meet that burden. And having read it, they rely heavily on all the evidence presented about how effective this care is in um, actually helping children as opposed to, to hurting them. So, you know, I think they have their work cut out for them, all these 13 plus states that are, uh, you know, pushing these, these laws forward. Molly, kind of going to, to real world effect, what resources are available to trans youth? Especially as you said now, they, they're aware of what's going on, how they're being harmed, what, what can they do? Where can they seek help? Thank you for that question. Um, well, I mean, I can speak you know, about Memphis, but I can also speak about a lot of other communities. Um, you know, trans youth, uh, should should and, and do seek out LGBTQ community centers like our organization in, in different metro areas and different parts of the country um, to build social connection, which is not only an important part of being a human, but as I said before, is connected with positive health outcomes in really important ways. Um, our organization provides support groups, some of which are peer-led, so um, trans uh, young people leading discussions and activities with their peers. Uh, we also have therapeutic support groups in addition to mental health services, and we also have a network of mental health referrals here in Memphis. Um, we are also, I'll give a, a shout out to the work that we do with Choices. We are working very aggressively now to create a, a thoughtful pipeline for youth in states that have bans to access care in the states that don't have bans, um, which is more than just an appointment. It's about you know, the entire life cycle of getting somewhere, making those connections. Um, we're uh, the, the Carbondale Clinic that Jen referred to. There's an, a, an amazing small organization called Rainbow Cafe. Um, that is a youth group and a youth drop-in center that we're working with to help them build up so that if there are you know, a young person from uh, Alabama or Mississippi going to Memphis, going to Carbondale for resources for HRT, they can also meet those pieces of connection. 
Um, I'll definitely say that uh, school environments are one of the most important factors in trans youth having, um, you know, healthy and happy and fulfilling lives. Parents who maybe your children or your aunt or your nieces or nephews may not be LGBTQ, but we, we need every person who has a connection to our school systems to be advocates for healthy and safe schools for LGBTQ young people. Um, Out Memphis works with GSAs, Gender and Sexuality Alliances, both in middle schools, high schools, and at our universities uh, to build up those networks. Uh, it's also really, really important in our faith communities to be educated around trans issues and LGBTQ issues so that folks who grow up in those communities have places to be themselves and to feel affirmed. Um, our organization also works with a network of national partners to connect basic resources for trans folks maybe living in poverty or having other kinds of instability outside of just HRT, like housing or transportation needs that are really, really important. And there are so many ways to give your money or your volunteer time or your expertise to all of us who are on the front line trying to provide those resources and that sense of connection. Thank you, Mom. So, Regina, I just want to turn to you. I think it's important to educate people on kind of the details of the Tennessee law. Um, and then I kind of want to end with, with Jennifer about the services that, that Choices in particular provides and, and, you know, logistically how people come to Choices and, and get the services they need there. So, so Regina, what are, what are kind of the key points of the Tennessee law that you think the public should know about? Thank you for this. Um, well, the very beginning of the law, um, when it talks about, they declare that it must take action to protect the health and welfare of minors. So it begins with this protective outreach. Um, it talks, the, the parts that I thought were particularly interesting for the justification process is that um, they brought in even pharmaceutical companies and, and the opioid epidemic. So um, as if the companies that were, that manufacture the uh, medications that transgender youth can take were somehow tied in with the opioid epidemic. It says um, the legislature finds that many of the same pharmaceutical companies that contributed to the opioid epidemic have sought to profit from the administration of these drugs um, to or use of devices on minors for such purposes. So it sort of starts with this, once again, building up fear of what's going to happen. Um, here they also then go into talking about um, financial incentives for physicians, that they find that the healthcare providers in this state have sought to perform surgeries on minors because of the financial incentive associated with the surgeries, not necessarily because they were in the minor's best interest, which is pretty staggering as well. This is where they make their declarations about the rationale behind it. Um, the legislature declares that the integrity and public respect of the medical profession is significantly harmed by healthcare providers that provide gender-friendly care, um, that they have to protect minors from both physical and emotional harm, that the, um, they don't have the ability to know that the physicians are not providing specific and, and medical, they, they question the, the medical, um, the, the quality of the medical care and the medical community, whether or not they're best practices. It, 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 it's really with a blind eye to all of the medical evidence. Um, the state has a le legitimate, substantial, compelling interest in protecting the integrity of the medical profession as well. So we, it really crosses over. Um, it does have an exception, which many of these bills do, for um, what they call congenital defects. So intersex children, where procedures are permitted if a child is an intersex child to get them back in that binary, male, female binary that um, the states have declared. Um, the other things about this that I think are, are is the private rights of action. So you have this private right of action of both the child and the parent that exists for 30 years after um, the, the care is rendered. Um, the parent cannot bring a claim if they consented to the treatment. So they're out if they gave consent. And, and then it really just talks about not only the 
the licensing of the medical professional, but also referring that to the Attorney General's office for potential criminal charges. And I think they have a 20 year, $25,000 per violation, $25,000 per violation. So if you were a medical professional and you were treating transgender youth, they would just multiply. Um, which, which you could see where then we have medical professionals who are torn between wanting to provide the best care and knowing what the standard of care is, the recommended standard of care, knowing that it's life um, saving in many cases and their license and potential criminal actions. Same with parents where um, the difference between being in a state, do I have to move to another state? So it really puts them in a terrible situation of can they afford to move? Is, it, is that the kind of thing some parents are moving, but not everyone's gonna have that luxury as well. So it really covers every possible, um, and then a few things that you wouldn't even expect to see. No, I, I encourage everyone to actually read the statute start to finish. It, it is interesting. Um, somewhat astounding, kind of the reasoning that's used to, to justify it. And just quickly, kind of one of the areas I, I researched while at the section is the, the banning of conversion therapy. And these same arguments that are being used uh, in support of gender affirming care, or banning gender affirming care, were used to, to try to support conversion therapy, namely allowing parents to have the right to let their children seek that kind of medical care because parents and those providers know what's best for the child. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard to, to not feel like there's a political motivation behind all this. So, I want to end on a positive note with, with Jennifer before we open up to questions. Choices is such a foundational organization here in Memphis. You know, what, what services are provided? How big is the reach? How can people learn more about choices? Yeah, uh, I want to go real quick on the follow up and assure you, as the person primarily responsible for our multi million dollar budget, that there is no profit in providing gender. <laughs> None at all. In fact, most of our insurance claims, if a person is insured or denied, or paid at the very minimal rates, like $10, 12 $13 for $100 worth of a doctor's time. And so, uh, but it's interesting, it's the same arguments that are made against abortion providers, and you just keep hearing me say that because it's the same people, y'all. Like, it's the same people that are trying, and it's not about any of these healthcare services in particular, it's about our rights to bodily autonomy, right? So, how does somebody come into care with choices? You give us a call. And we will walk you through the process over the telephone, we'll talk to your parents and we'll talk to the youth. We also have an incredibly robust patient care fund where most of our adolescents, if not all of our adolescents, and many of our adults accessing gender affirming care never pay anything for the care that they receive at Choices. The uh, medications that are often prescribed are all in a generic form at this point, so the pharmaceutical companies are also not making a profit off of this. Um, and we will talk and evaluate whether they want to come into care in our Memphis clinic, our Carbondale clinic, or maybe there's another provider that is a better fit for them, that's closer to them in another state. And that is really where our partnership with Memphis comes into place. Um, and so that they can provide the wraparound support services. Because the truth of the matter is setting up an appointment and providing a prescription is the easy part in all of this. And I don't mean that in any kind of condescending way, but it is really the social, mental, and community connections that Molly and everybody's talking about that are the really critical pieces for our transgender and non-binary neighbors. And so if folks want to learn more, go to our website, yourchoices.org, or give us a call, and we have very uh, willing and excited staff to help people try to access care in any ways they can. And cost is never a barrier for folks. We will figure that out for them. Thank you, Jennifer. And I, I think we'll take a couple questions because I want to leave time for, you know, after the, the panel for you all to, to be able to talk to the panelists before the next session sets up. So do we have any questions in, in the audience? Yes. I just wonder, with all of this Who's, who's 
next because we all knew uh, when marriage equality uh, was declared as a report that there was going to be a backlash and we can tell those trans kids that are taking one of that, but who comes after trans kids? Are you talking about within the LGBTQ community or just within our... Well, you know, that would be a good place to start because I'm sure there's uh, you know, another segment, but you know, that, that's the sad part. That you know, these are hard won victories, and I think that you know, based on law, as um, we're talking about, neither one of us are constitutional scholars, but just uh, based on the stuff, it, it seems like you're going to be successful on this. But you know, this is not going to end. So maybe Lucas can give us an idea or where he sees this going. We now have a, a gender non conforming where you're not a letter yeah. on the alphabet. Um, yeah. And the, I, I think a lot with pronouns, where we have they, them, people who don't identify on a certain spectrum, I see that much more um, with students. I still have to learn. I have a student who's here now, and she brought me something. She got me a gift called the Queen's Dictionary because it had terminology that I wasn't familiar with that I had to keep up with. But it, it, I think you're right. It's going to be the next different thing. Um, bisexuals, perhaps. I know that they felt excluded from some of the case law where we've talked about sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, but I do think that this this idea of not having, not identifying on this gender binary, and um, it, it seems silly to me pronouns. But to to me, I had to learn. The hardest thing for me is that I also teach legal writing, and uh, using the singular there. Uh, that was really hard until I got used to it. But, but it, if it's going to make a difference for a person, it just seems so simple, but it's a big deal, and I'm waiting for, you know, we've got Title IX, and we will find out in the next few weeks with Title IX. I think that I've read the state of Tennessee's considering rejecting federal funds um, from the Department of Education so that they can maintain um, separate bathrooms, not allow transgender child to use the bathroom they identify with, and to um, not wear with sports as well, which just, and, and pronouns, which is also a problem, and we've seen that. So um, I, I, I'm sure there will be one. It's just going to have to kind of rise and float up and, and not, it's like whack a mole, right? I think it's, it's going to be transgender adults. Yeah. And uh, contraception is on the chopping block too next, especially when these arguments around the Comstock law is coming back up. And so I think we're going to see continued attacks on people with uteruses and transgender and non-gender conforming folks. Anybody that doesn't isn't a cisgender white male is probably needs to be looking out for their rights at this point. I also noticed um, I have a class this semester I've been teaching called Gender in the Law. And we start in the late 40s with Eisenhower's executive order and go into like the lavender scare. There's such a pattern to everything yeah. where the fear, where we had all of this fear, communism and homosexuals involved in communism, and then we come out of it. And then we had kind of a little lull. Um, the beginning of this century was pretty amazing, right? We had Lawrence and Windsor, Bergefell, things. Uh, I think that it's the lack of control, especially with supermajority Republican um, legislatures, where they don't have control of a lot of these issues. So it's finding where they can get that control. And, and I think you're right. I mean, it's just, um, where can we get the most control in? How do we sell that package? It's the fear behind it. And so when you look back at like the executive orders and the lavender scare, there was no need. There were no connections to communism, but it still impacted thousands and thousands of lives for such a long period before it was even debunked. And so we, we make up for that, and we try to, and then the next thing and the next thing. So I'm sure that there will be. I, I do look forward to finding out how Vostok's going to play out. I think if we can get um, this idea that discriminating based, uh, based on sex when you discriminate against a person, that regardless if it's under Title VII or Title IX or 1557 or housing or credit, it's discrimination based on sex. And so we'll see how this will. Uh, I'm concerned, my main concern right now is with these executive orders. Right now, 
We have so many protections that are through executive order, but they change. So if we have a, a new, whoever's sitting in the Oval Office has so much control because we don't have protections, um, statutory protections. So I'm concerned about two years from now, a little over, um, what's gonna happen if we don't have enough, if we don't have Biden or whoever is a Democrat that would support the same type of issues in the White House. Any other questions? Uh, perfect. Well, thank you so much to the panel. I really appreciate the time. Um, I know you all have a busy schedule, so thank you so much for being here. Let's give our panel a round of applause.